Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the late shift, but this is the good shift. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. And we have a very special guest for you this afternoon, a true leader in cybersecurity and cybersecurity careers and training pathways. Um, it's really a privilege to introduce to you today, Mr. Dumasani Gumbi. He is the Group IT Governance and Compliance Manager at a very large South African insurance company. He is also the Deputy Chairperson of the Cape Peninsula University Technology uh, Council, and he sits on the Board of Directors at ISAKA's SA Chapter. So I don't think we could have found a better placed expert to take you through this really complex world of careers and specialization pathways in cybersecurity. And without further ado, Dimasani, thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Thank you for the glowing introduction. Um, it is complicated indeed, and um, I hope to demystify it uh, for everybody. Um, good afternoon. I think, as Noel said, my name is Dimsana Kumbi, and uh, this is what we're going to be diving into. So please let me know. Feel free to ask questions at any point in time. Um, I'm happy to, to be guided by you. So again, um, What's cybersecurity all about? I think we're going to get straight into it. Just as a heads up, there are some slides that are very busy. Don't panic. Uh, we're all in it together. We're all in this boat together. We're trying to figure out which way it's rocking um, so that we can make meaningful decisions. The, the main goal of this session is to inform so that we can act and make informed choices. So. Cybersecurity is trendy, but what is it? It's 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 is it smokes and mirrors? Is there something really there? Is there really a threat? Or is there an industry? Is this something where you want to spend the rest of your working life, dedicate 20 to 20 to 35 years uh towards something that's potentially smokes and mirrors? But most importantly, who cares? Who cares about cybersecurity and who should care about cybersecurity? Um, and I think one question that you have that I've grappled with for, for almost my entire working career is, is it for me? You know, and uh, <clears throat> how then, if it is for me, how do I get in it? You know, so once I'm in it and I realize, oh, it's not for me, how do I get out? Right. And what does getting out look like? How do you how do you manage the separation in legal terms? OK, and. Once you've enjoyed it, you've gotten in and you really love it, what next? How do you make sure that you navigate and grow your cybersecurity career to the nth degree? Okay, so we're gonna throw around some thoughts, we're gonna throw around some views, but please, 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 let's interact. And I'm and I'm, I'm keen, I look forward to hearing um, a lot of you. So what is cybersecurity? So I think if, if I could, I would ask the room, what do you think cybersecurity is? Uh, and I'm sure we would get a whole host of mixed responses. Um, some would say cybersecurity is this, some would say cybersecurity is that. I spent a great deal of time, almost two years, dedicated to unpacking the definition of cybersecurity. Okay, but before we get into that, um, I saw 27,000. I swear that's the only Greek I'm going to speak tonight. I saw 27,000 says you should have a system to manage your cybersecurity, right? So in a nutshell, what is it about? At the top, it's about managing risk. On the side, to the left-hand side of the black block, it's about being aware of what could go wrong. Where could it go wrong? How do you respond after it goes wrong? And what then do you do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? That's it. OK, so this is the type of conversation that we're going to have a lot of complex content on the screen, but very simple articulation coming from my end. OK, so I will take you through it. Don't panic. All right. So this in a nutshell is what an information security management system looks like. The entire universe of cybersecurity revolves around the following guardrails. Again, this evolves. We live in a very rapid space where the threats change all the time and the place where business conduct is taking place changes all the time. It used to be limited to the workplace. It then became uh, a part workplace, part internet, and now it's in your pocket. 
OK, so we need to be very careful about the workplace and how we define uh, the, the, the domain where cybersecurity takes place. I've spoken to what could go wrong in the middle is how then do you respond? And on the right hand side is how do we make sure that we get to the root cause of what went wrong? and avoid it happening again. The slides will be shared. Um, please don't be put off, okay? Let's get back to the definition. So if I was to ask you, what is cybersecurity? A lot of you would probably give me the information security definition. The information security definition, however, is not the definition for cybersecurity because that speaks to the broader body of knowledge. Why are definitions important? If you observe it, you would have seen the Ghostbuster logo pop up at the, at, the, at the corner. That I will explain in a minute, but please do keep your eyes on the Ghostbuster. Uh, it's not Ghost Pops. This one is for the Ghostbuster. Okay. Um, right. So information security, Who do we, what do we define information security? That's the definition. Cyber security, on the other hand, is the bit different in that it looks to protect the assets in a globally connected environment. So what could go wrong based on where we are taking place and where we are transacting? But that's not it. A lot of the time, when people speak of cyber security, they inadvertently refer to cyber crime, right? When they speak about an incident having taken place, the reference could be cybercrime. Why are the definitions important? If you are looking to get into the industry, you need to know which line of work you actually mean to pursue and what are the requirements of getting into that particular line of work. Okay, let's break it even further. What is not cybersecurity? Cyber espionage. So when we look at threats and actors and when we look at who can perpetrate or who can circumvent the controls of another environment or of another business. That's where we're now saying between industrials or between organizations, when one attacks the other for purposes of stealing their intellectual property or their know-how or their goodwill, what do we call that? Is it still cyber crime? Is it still cyber security? What is that? Okay, so what you call it? determines how you react to it. Okay, So it's extremely important that we get the, the lexicon correct and we get the parlance correct. Then we speak about an extreme end and form of cyber, uh, 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 a form of cyber crime within the cyber security domain. And here we're speaking about cyber terrorism. Okay, so there can be many instances of cyber crime and there can be many uh, modes in which it's conducted, right? But what you call it is vitally important. And that's why if you haven't spent time um, just getting around the terminology, please I implore you spend time in just understanding the very basics. What do we mean when we speak about cyber security? It's not cyber terrorism. It's not cyber crime. It's not cyber espionage. Definitely not information security. Is it an act of war? Professor Noel is best positioned to define this one. But again, if you look at the talent manual and if you look at all of the information before us, it tells us long before technology and long before uh, undersea cables, which were interrupted last week, we've always had nations being interested in what the weakness of another nation could be that they could exploit. And that doesn't stop and that hasn't stopped. In fact, it's still happening as we speak. Um, it's not always nation to nation. Sometimes the nation will sponsor an act of cyber crime so that it can be perpetuated against an industry and sometimes against individuals. Okay, so we need to be very mindful of what we call it. Again, what I'm showing here is the role players when we speak about cyber crime. Somebody needs to carry out the threat. Somebody needs to take the action, which we'd call uh, various vectors, and they need to carry it out against something. So there needs to be a target for that particular action. OK, until the action is taken place, it's a risk. Here we're speaking about the possibility of harm befalling a country, a municipality, a state, a business, an individual or a business. OK, so please let's be careful. So let's take a simple example. If one government conducts an act of cyber, cyber, a cyber attack against another government, here we're speaking about cyber warfare, okay? But if an, a government 
carries out the same act and sponsors an, a, a, a group of rogue individuals to carry out a cyber attack against a business. Here we're speaking about an act of cyber espionage. It's no longer cyber war, right? Why is that important? An act of cyber war is a military act. Remember we spoke about the Ghostbuster? What was the slogan for Ghostbusters? If you recall, now you say it with me, who are you going to call, right? And that's important. If you have the wrong definition, we're going to call the wrong people. The wrong people will take the wrong actions. And at the end of the day, your chances of restoring the business, catching the perpetrator, and proving in a court of law in a convincing manner, having collected and preserved the information, will be null and void. If you call the police to investigate the matter that should that falls within the square domain of the military, you have a problem. Remember, in our space, time matters, right? If you call the police to investigate a business affair where a municipality's electricity or where a city's um, a traffic control system has been sabotaged and you need a interlateral agreement that will speak, uh, that will make sure that you can investigate and restore power, restore electricity, restore heating. How do you go about doing it? Your local police will not have jurisdiction. OK, so that's why it's extremely important to know what just happened. Who do I call so that they can do what about it? OK. It's extremely important that we get uh, this understanding so that you know in which line of work do you want to get to? Which phone call do you want to receive? Okay. Right now, if you break it down, this is the definition I like because here it's all encompassing. It speaks about what happens inside cybersecurity, not necessarily what is cybersecurity and limiting it to what it is. Here we're saying cybersecurity as a discipline and as a science is about strategy policy and standards regarding the security of the entire operation that is now hosted within your cyberspace. Okay, so that can be online. Again, it speaks about reduction, risk management, international engagement, incident response, recovery, all of the exciting stuff, right? So if you forget anything today, please remember this definition. This definition is not only textbook, but it's practical. After every comma is a function that you could be performing should you get into cybersecurity and if cybersecurity still tickles your fancy after this session. Okay, so that was the hard lifting. Um, there's one or two hairy slides, but again, please hold on, hang in there and we'll move across. Remember right now, all that we've covered is what is it, what do you call it and who are you going to call when that cyber incident is taking place? Also, which uniform do you want to wear? Do you want to be the respondent in military uniform, in police uniform, behind a uh, corporate desk, or doing the intel sitting, uh, hovering and looking at the treaty lines between countries and the behavior in cyberspace? Okay. Um, if it's sounding sci-fi, it's because uh, fiction is based on truth and truth always follows fiction. Okay. Right, we've spoken a lot about the definition and about what it is, but is there really the threat of cybercrime? Is it really as big as we we are we are made to believe? And is it really um, worth paying all of this attention to? If you ask the World Economic Forum, they'll confirm that over the last couple of years, cyber attacks. If you follow with me, that the second bar from the top, these are the risks that we are worried about globally. Right, so. AI generated misinformation and disinformation. In the last day, we used to say that AI systems are hallucinating or they make up facts. They said it was a limitation between 3.5 and 4.0 wouldn't do it. But again, garbage in, garbage out. Okay, large language modules is something that I would love to speak about and natural language processing, but not today. So AI generated misinformation is a risk, right? We've seen deep fake videos. We've seen sentiment informed by information which is not really credible or dependable. A lot of a lot of a lot of us will be voting this year globally. I think there's about 28 countries that will be having elections this year. What do you vote based on? You vote based on 
information that evokes sentiment and feelings, right? And if that information is not genuinely true, what then is going to skew the vote? The vote? Okay, so AI generated misinformation for that reason is the second highest risk that the world over is worried about. If you recall, Spain banned uh, um, um, the rollout of uh, gen, gen AI. Similarly, Italy banned it. I think a lot of the South American countries banned it uh, up until they were satisfied that there won't be discrimination, there won't be unfair bias, there won't be baked in uh, hallucination and controls that will ultimately affect the prospects of real people when they use uh, this generative AI. Similarly, in the top five that we are worried about globally the world over, cyber attacks is a real thing. So this is not smokes and mirrors, colleagues. This is a real pain that's keeping the world leaders up at night. Okay. So if they are up at night, then the businesses are up at night and our managers are up at night. And we as educators and we in the education and the information transformation space have to share raise awareness and equip so that we can help um, and respond to the crisis that we are seeing now globally. Um, again, please do keep up with the World Economic Forum. Uh, they meet in the beginning of the year and they, 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 they then evaluate um, uh, together with the UN, they evaluate where do we stand in terms of these global hazards and these risks. Remember, the other side of risk is opportunity. So when you look at these risks, it, it means there's employment opportunity and there's career opportunities because the world over, this is a genuine concern, right? Concerns are met by action, program, and resourcing, okay? Again, if it's smokes and mirrors, it wouldn't have a price, right? So what happens to the data once it is compromised once it is stolen. So if my login information uh, onto Twitter or onto my banking platform is stolen, what happens to it? And how much is it worth in the hands of a perpetrator? In this reel, you'll see that this data ranges from $40 to $150 for mere login credentials, right? Now, if you take that and you say, how much is four digits of a 16 digit MasterCard credit card field. If they have four, it ranges from 100 to 150. If they have eight digits, it goes all the way to $200. And if they've got 16 digits and a positive bank balance, you're looking at something like uh, $110. Okay, so please appreciate that this is a real industry. The individuals who are uh, employed or who were recruited to compromise the security controls within uh, of individuals, of businesses, and of countries are remunerated. They 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 are heavily remunerated. Um, there's a theory that a lot of the individuals that perform uh, these particular acts of crime are sponsored by certain states. That right? they're not just. Uh, pursuing an individual uh, commercial enterprise where they have a business and they hack for a business. No, some do, and those are ethical hackers who, who whose sole purpose is to strengthen um, the design and the controls within our systems. But those that don't have, uh, uh, that don't mean well, can actually make a handsome living from the dark web. So if you didn't know, if you save your credentials and you have a very poor password manager on your next Airbnb trip, your information could be sold for $300, okay? Again, this level of crime doesn't stop electronically. That information can be used to produce official looking physical documentation like passports um, and so forth. So I only listed about eight criteria, uh, six criteria, but there's, there's, there's over 32 criteria um, that is now being traded and sold on the dark web, okay? Lastly, and shockingly, um, the very act of circumventing controls or hacking uh, controls can even be rented. So you can rent a denial of service attack that will run every minute for the next 30 uh, days. Um, that will set you back about two thousand dollars. OK, so you can even buy um, the services and, 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 and have them on on retainer. So again, it's not 
uh, uh, smokes and mirrors, and it's definitely not just the hype. Okay, so let's look at what we worried about the world over. Okay, so if you look at um, what companies or the response from companies has been in the last year or two, 69% increase has been spent on improving cybersecurity controls and cybersecurity related features within the businesses. Okay. The cost to respond to a typical data breach, 4.5 million US collectively. Okay. There is a lot of money in responding, in restoring business services and in preventing um, the harm that can fall to a company uh, uh, from cybersecurity. So Again, what is keeping business up at night? Uh, business is saying we need resources. If you look at the top 10 risks within the many of the businesses, uh, they've got cybersecurity as a number one, and they have critical skills and shortage as number two. So this is the right topic, right? How then do you avail yourself to make sure that, or how do you put your hand up and say, hi, I'm here, I'm interested. If you need somebody that is trainable, that's got the right attitude, that can um, um, stick it out and, and learn quickly, I'm adaptable, I can put my hand up. So they're looking for technicians, application software developers, they're looking for network uh, uh, technicians and individuals that can safeguard the physical controls and the perimeter controls, but most importantly, they're looking for cybersecurity talent all around, okay? Why? because prevention is cheaper than cure. CEOs are having to fall in their swords because they downplay the effects and the threat of cybersecurity. So the 10 areas where cybersecurity is felt the most right now, again, it's the physical security, perimeter security, AI as a threat. I mean, AI is not only uh, assisting individuals who are looking for productivity and efficiency in their ethical workplace, those who are employed, like we saw in the unethical workplace, are also using AI to, 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 to gain, to be more efficient in how they circumvent your controls and how they water down whatever protection layers you may have, okay? And again, um, those that are familiar with the industry know that your supplier's risks become your risks. If your supplier is delayed or runs out of power or runs out of budget or has an inability to meet your service. It means your client and your customer's order is delayed because your service provider had a risk uh, that delayed the order uh, um, along the way. OK, so it's extremely important uh, if you look at, I mean, this is um, risk number eight. If you look at the trends, the mega trends from last year and again, Internet of Things and the proliferation of sensors. Um, the list goes on and on, on and on. Um, if your car has uh, instrumentation and controls, almost every car has got, I mean, we, we, we're seeing driverless cars, we're seeing way more rollout vehicles without the need for a driver. Um, and a lot of that is centrally controlled or running on pre-built uh, uh, rules and decision-making and decision support systems. Those can be overridden if they fall into the wrong hands. So the very the very advancement of human technology is also opening a door into uh, and again a lot of those that do hack are doing it for a challenge. So the more you invest in the security controls, the more they want to respond and rise to the challenge and demonstrate their prowess as superior hackers. Okay, um, just a snapshot of which industries have been affected and have fallen victim. Uh, to these attacks that we've been speaking about. If you look at the black graph on the list, the education sector has been hit the most. This is a 2023 report, um, uh, and uh, it shows you that it's not just the military grade. So we spoke about the cyber warfare. It's not theoretical. There you have it. Um, country to country, cyber activity continues to place. And again, this is we're seeing this as the second highest uh, 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 criteria where we have a lot of cyber risk activity that, or cyber uh, security activity and incidents that took place uh, last year. And what I pause here, just for a caveat, it's important but equally difficult to have statistics around cyber security and worse, data privacy. A lot of the companies who suffer incidents simply do not report. So when we put reports out and when we put stat statistics out, please know that it's, 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 
it's a sample and we're speaking to the broader community. Businesses generally are too embarrassed to report or they know that there will be a public fallout if they do come forward and disclose that they suffered harm. Okay. Similarly, we've seen a, 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 a very alarming increase in ransomware. And again, it's affected the industries in red. So manufacturing, healthcare, and so forth. What again, what's the question that we're answering? Is does the world really have a cyber security problem? Yes. Right. So this is what we're seeing. Okay. So who cares if we have a cyber security problem, right? Um who's who should care? I mean, aren't there clever people that are employed to deal with this and that get paid a truckload of money to make sure that this doesn't happen? If you want to get into the industry, it's extremely important to know who cares because those that do care about cybersecurity and the peace that can be uh, garnered around cybersecurity are your future employers, right? So who are we talking about? First and foremost, the very people that oversee and direct and are responsible for the functioning of the business, and that is the board. The board, uh, as supported by its uh, committees, is worried about the state of cybersecurity. Okay, this is a fiduciary function because the board, uh, by law, is responsible for the risk management within an entity. Again, the risk committees and those that play a broader role in making sure that the business continues to operate are worried about cybersecurity. The people that award you your operating license to continue operating are worried about your posture on cybersecurity. Your competitors and your peers. They waiting on the day that you release that you've suffered a particular vulnerability or you've been compromised in one way or the other. OK, so they are worried about uh, cybersecurity, but most importantly, your client will not return and will not come back to do business with you if you suffer an incident and don't show uh, and implement the required corrective measures, preventative measures and reassure them that you've got sufficient controls to continue doing business with you. OK, similarly, the investors, your reporting, your ESG community and so forth. So it's not just a technical conversation. So in other words, this profession is not just a technical profession. There are role players and there are roles to be played even outside of the technical construct of cyber security. OK, right now the juicy part is this for me. So do I really want to be woken up and have a standby phone, have a call out, emergency call out, be invited into a particular uh, um, investigation of an outage? Is this for me, right? Again, I'm going to list the very, very simple uh, high level description. So if you look at the high level description, you can have um, roles such as cyber security specialist, network technician, IT security analyst, uh, ethical hackers. If you remember what we spoke about, right? In, in the previous slide, we spoke about the shortage of uh, specific cyber security skills. The reason why I've got this three layer table here is so that we can identify and appreciate where to start, right? Throughout the conversation, we'll be speaking about entry level, that's beginner level, intermediate, which is the mid level and senior, uh, and that is the, the 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 upper trough of the skills that we're looking at. This will be backed up by the skills requirement that you need for that. So certification is the ticket to the game, but it's not the only way into um, the particular game. All right. So I'll unpack the rules a little bit now. Um, Again, from the beginning, if you look at how to get in, a lot of us start out as analysts, okay? So we are responsible for investigating or for monitoring and detecting if the business is still humming and moving according to how we expect them to move. This matures and as you go and you become a responder or you're an engineer or you become an architect, it goes all the way up to a level where you then understand and you can be trusted as a chief information security officer or even the manager. But in between, there's a very popular role of a penetration tester. Now, a penetration tester, um, and, and again, as technology moves, as we move from having businesses and servers on the actual precinct and having them in the cloud, the need for security changes, right? So you need individuals who are trained on 
how to secure applications in the cloud. Now, how do you make sure that you've got the right level of security? That's where penetration testing comes in. But also, there's a career that can be made from individuals who develop software security. Okay, so again, we'll speak to the skill set just now, but I'm going to leave here and we'll share the deck uh, um, um, for you to, 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 to familiarize yourself with some of the detail. I spoke about busy slides. This is the busiest slide and there's two more that comes with it, but it's a very simple slide if you look at it. So on the extreme left, you've got the beginner, the intermediate and the expert. So that's bottom up. And if you go, if you read it across, we've got the various areas where you could come in and perform a cyber security role. So you could be involved in communications and network security. If you want to, if that is where you see your passion lying, in other words, you want to make sure that from signal broadcasting, uh, uh, um, comms and, and security around uh, uh, communication facilitation platforms and services, that is where you, that you will focus on. That becomes your tranche. But if you feel you are drawn to um, identity and access management, privilege and access management, you are now moving closer to the turquoise uh, channel. And to start out, these are some of the certifications that are there. It's very difficult to have the same overlay with university degrees. And I'll speak about university degrees and some of the formal higher education uh, 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 equivalents because they are there. This is not just a certification entry route, okay? Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can amass the same information and just interact with the certifying authority when you do write um, the, the, the particular exam. So we've got individuals who will be involved in the governance of security. So what must we do? What structures do we need? What programs do we need? What resources do we need? And um, what certification do we need in order to prove that uh, and to reassure those who care about our security that we've achieved the right posture and we have the right controls? That is where your GRC comes in, your governance risk and compliance comes in. Risk is an ever prevalent function within security. OK, then you have assessment testing, software security, penetration testing, and in between, should there be an, ex an incident or should there be a, a, a breach of your security, it's going to be important to have incident handling and forensic uh, capabilities within the business. So they will then need special training to come in and say, right, what went wrong and how do we prevent it from happening again? OK, so it's from the design of the information entering into the systems, into the organization, onto your network, reaching your client, coming back for processing all the way up until testing and making sure that the controls are working and how do you recover from a particular incident. These are the parts that you can choose to specialize in. And, and, and this is where I would direct one. Let, let's, so I'm going to speak about prompt engineering. It's all about asking the right question. What hooks or what piques your interest and what is the next question that you should be asking in order to find out a little bit more? So I'm hoping to give you just about enough information to help you ask the next round of information that can help you uh, make that particular career uh, defining um, decision. OK, this is a much easier slide here. It's structured in the very approach. So if you realize that, look, I'm not much of a developer and I'm not much of a hardware and a networking person, I prefer uh, uh, training and my passion is to make sure that I can train uh, individuals so that they don't fall victim to phishing, they don't fall victim to all of the various exploits um, that I see my family falling for within the WhatsApp groups and the Telegram. How do I then get involved within training? Because that I realize is a big need within environments. I think as we speak industry wide, um, very few organizations achieve more than 40% of end user training and out of that 40 percent very few um, actually pass uh, the, the the fishing test above 70 percent so the need for training is prevalent and training is mandatory right? a lot of the regulations and a lot of the laws insist on having uh, a uh, it security awareness and training program within your business okay so these are just some of the tranches 
that are there for you to go in. Again, certification is the easiest way to organize it because there is a lot of certification out there and people, one, waste a lot of money, two, lose hope along the way because they start with the wrong certification, end up doing the wrong type of work and lose heart along the way, okay? Then it becomes the industry's fault. It's not the industry's fault, okay? Like we've, expli like we've explicitly stated in the beginning, this industry needs resources, but which resources? That starts with you. Where does your interest lie? Where does your passion lie? And how do you get started? Okay, again, this I'm going to skip. Uh, it's just some of the some of the organizations that provide certification. It's extremely important to note that this is where I would recommend you go to write the exam. It's not necessarily where you go to get the information and acquire the knowledge. There's a lot of free platforms and there's a lot of fantastic programs like this one that can train you on how to access and get hold of this particular information in preparation for the very exams. OK. OK, so we've said a whole mouthful now. How do I then get involved? I want in, I want to uh, make a living and make uh, contribute towards um, making the world a better place. How do I get involved in cybersecurity? The most obvious route is certification, but it's also the most expensive route. Please bear that in mind, right? Here you need to have researched, collected all the information that is required and make an informed choice on which certification is going to be best for you. Similarly, it's going to be important uh, 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 sometimes certification is a problem. Get into the right program. There's there's multiple tiers of higher education in, in, in the world. Get involved in the right institution. Make sure that the IT program that they provide has got a cybersecurity component to it. OK, so that you can get in there. And again, if it's a, 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 a two to three year program of study, make sure that the electives that you choose uh, can package and, 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 and steer you towards the right cybersecurity career that you want. If it's software development backed by network engineering, backed by uh, uh, training at the very end, make sure that you choose. So in other words, Go through the course outline, go through the course, the program pamphlet, look at the ex the assignments and the deliverables that they did in previous years. And a good indication is always to look at the various master's programs uh, that they publish. What, what topics did they focus on and what supervisors do they have uh, 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 capacity? Uh, what can they supervise over? What do they generally supervise uh, when they um, great um, cybersecurity postgraduate papers. Okay, so that's how you get in. Mm. Masani, you've got 10 minutes. Awesome. Thanks, I'll speed it up. Uh, again, so you've gotten in there and you realize this is way too technical for me. I can't keep up with logs. I can't keep up with maintaining certification. I, I, I write better. I'm a pictures person. I'm a great investigator, right? This uh, I like, but not so much the day-to-day -day work. Don't lose heart, right? There is a need for policy writers. There's a need for standards developers. There's a need for business continuity. And again, the data governance and the data privacy space needs specific uh, data protection and data safeguards that uh, uh, will depend on cybersecurity. Data leakage protection is one that I can think about and all of those uh, uh, particular uh, um, encryption and preventative programs. So if you are like me and you're drawn to assurance and the legal side of things, when everything goes wrong and when there's prosecution and investigation, you need a lawyer who can speak cyber, okay? So if cyber is not for you, perhaps the law is for you yet your interest in cyber will still be serviced and you can specialize in that particular world. Similarly, if you're an architect at heart and you're a tinker at heart and you like developing, we need privacy by design. We need cyber security by design. This is a domain of DevSecOps and enterprise architecture. So the, 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 the skills that you acquire when you get into cyber security are not limited just to the technical domain. You can apply them uh, throughout. So 
by getting out and put that as a tongue in cheek, you can still remain in cybersecurity and be in risk in governance. You can be an auditor that specializes in information security, or you can even be a strategy developer that specializes in cloud based um, security. OK, lastly. Whatever got you into cybersecurity, should you choose to follow through with cybersecurity, will not keep you in cybersecurity and it won't make you successful in cybersecurity. This is a rapidly evolving field of work. It's important to stay abreast. It's important to continuously refresh, but it's also important to build on what you had when you came in. So if it was only certification that you had when you got into the industry, get a degree, right? You will not move into management. And if you do, it will be difficult to see you become a CISO or a, uh, a chief executive that informs your chief executive on digital uh, strategy and digital channels and uh, proliferation and growing the business into the next degree with only certification. OK, there are the build on your certification. There are some certificates that you can do that are meant for executive uh, level, but again, move and grow linearly. So make sure that you you, you stretch yourself. There's consulting opportunities. Um, and again, once you've mastered your craft, give back. It's extremely important to make sure that we, we lift as we rise. There is a shortage and there is a big risk of burnout. There's a big risk of mental uh, 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 mental fatigue. And there's also a lot of um, there's a lot of imbalance that people sort of tend to suffer as they rush through um, the various stages. Cybersecurity is very demanding. Okay, so again, it's going to be important to advise, to mentor, and again, some of the standards. Who's going to develop the South African AI standard or the AI Act for South Africa if we don't give back and we don't get involved? in uh, 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 some of these. South Africa is just a placeholder. It could be whatever country you're coming from. So it's extremely important for those that are far advanced in their journey to make sure that they become fellows of the industry and fellows of the sector. And that is me, colleagues. Um, thank you so much for, for your time. I hope that I've given you the next question to ask that can get you closer um to 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 put in together a cv and saying i'm here um pick me uh i'd like to get started in the field of cyber engineering lastly prompt engineering prompt engineering is extremely important because it's the art of asking questions okay the answers are all there you got to figure out how to ask the question thanks noel Dimasoni, <clears throat> awesome presentation. I think the students are going to have a lot to ask. You've given us all a lot to think about, but also I think really shone a light on where you can fit in. You know, cybersecurity, there's room for everybody, um, for all different kinds of aptitudes. And that's a key takeaway. And I, I loved your comments on remember to keep growing and grow both technically but educationally as well, if you really want to keep going up and up. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start with questions. And the first question is sure. from Nombeku, who asks, what could be the reason of the education sector being the hardest hit by cyber attacks? Oh, that's that's a very good question, but it's also a very easy question. So what are the typical numbers in a university. So a typical university or institution of high learning has over 120,000 applicants year on year, even though they only enroll about 30 to 40,000 people. That dwarfs many organizations. Universities are super institutions. They, they, they have data and that data re retention and collection rules uh, mean that they need to keep financial data health data and academic data for longer periods than many organizations. So they're rich with information. If you if you want, and again, a lot of them are, are, are in the control of uh, the public hands. So the security budget is a bit lower and the security controls are a bit lower, a bit more relaxed. So that's why they become the targets. Thanks to Masani. And, and of course, they've got thousands of torrenting students. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
And there's a lot of illegal software in Varsity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, next up from a colleague of mine at CPUT, Sukhwadi Mabunda. So good to see you here. Um, Sukhwadi asks, on the getting out slide, if you like me, you're a lawyer researching cybercrime. Do you think it's imperative to get that technical certification even at a, sorry, to, a, as a foundation at a junior level? Is it possible to succeed without it? Um, that's a very, very uh, subjective question, but a great question at that. Um, you, in, I think Sukal would appreciate this. The, the, it, previously, you couldn't become a lawyer with only just a legal degree. You needed to first have shown proficiency in your area, and then on top of it, you become a lawyer. So it's always nice to have the technical grounding to show that um, and you can then translate those concepts into the legal domain. So you become a better advocate. It becomes easier to speak it, easier to, to get the buy-in. Uh, and 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 you become a a, a better in-house uh, counsel when you have the technical skills. Otherwise, if you just want to um, 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 be a friend of cybersecurity, but without going the security route or without going the certification route, consultation and um, consulting would be a better um, um, angle if you don't want to get the technical certification. But if that is your area of of expertise and where you want to grow your services. I highly recommend getting um, certification. A lot of the law firms, you well, know, I don't know if you know, but they are hiring CIOs now, um, and they're hiring them at partner level. Um, this 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 was never the case, and we're growing into a specialist area of legal technology and cyber technology for law firms because of the amount of personal information that notaries and conveyances, in particular, have got uh, in their disposal. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, an ongoing challenge for the profession to produce enough people to now start stretching outside of the uh, um, security yeah. sector and and, yeah. and onwards. I'm going to allow um, Senamile has a question. I've unmuted your mic. Senamile, if you can go ahead and ask your question, please. Thank you, thank you, Noel. Um, hi, Dumisani. I would, my hey. question is going to be short. With regards to GRC, which um, certification is based? Should I do just CompTIA or um, CompTIA in security if I want to be a GR, um, to be in GRC in cybersecurity? Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Um, so, I mean, the GRC has two commas in between because it's three separate functions. So governance, COVID, that's the domain of governance. Risk, there's a lot that you can do in risk. Um, CompTIA is a great start, but don't underestimate the C. Okay? The C is extremely important because that's where you make friends with audit, with compliance, with legal, to make sure that whatever you recommended in the G and the R can be independently measured and it can be matured and improved uh, uh, over time through review okay so certifications it will be de determined by which of the three letters best appeals to you they each have a particular path to follow okay um noel you're on mute <laughs> okay so thanks i've unmuted you lafuna next question Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Domesan. Quickly, I just wanted you to advise what certification will I need to be a DevSecOps engineer? I would and recommend a degree. Software development or software you, engineering is so powerful. It gives you a rich foundation and you, you it, it prepares you for it. I'm a legal person. <laughs> You, you want me to that. start from bar? No, you didn't say that. Now I know. Okay, so software <laughs> engineering. Um, a lot of the DevSecOps certification right now is very thorough. 
and very good. And if you're new to engineering and have a background in something else, it's always nice to understand where, what are the trends in software development right now? And a lot of the development that's taking place is cloud hosted and cloud facing. So it may be worth your while to, to consider a uh, something in the AWS stack um, and towards the, towards the uh, DevSecOps. Always go for the disciplines. The, the, the certifications and the products purport to do more than they end up doing. Rather go for the discipline than the, than the, than the label on the package. Okay. Like you can't sell GRC software, for example. No, nothing, nothing can sell GRC. Very wise words. Thanks, Dumasani. Next question, Anton Dawson. I've got the opportunity to do my degree in cyber in a year. Do I postpone doing my degree and go for a bunch of suits in the same time, then go for a degree after I get into cyber? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. The problem, though, Anton, is once you get a taste of cash, once you get that salary, oh, man, it becomes difficult to go in. So my mentor always told me this. Get the degree. The degree gets you in the door and the certification determines your hourly rate. OK, get the degree to get in the door, the certification to move up as a function, as a functional specialist. OK, but once you need to move up again, remember the degree, the certification that got you in is not the certification that's going to get you to the next level. Um, but to get started, and if you have a sponsor that can pay thirty to forty thousand for your degree for your certificates, um, go for it. There's, 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 there's no, there's no reason why you can't get into the industry and then get a bursary to study further and get that degree. Thanks, Dumasani. Next up, um, Sally Smith. I've unmuted your hey. mic. Sally. Sally, sorry. Are you there? Okay, um, having a difficulty there. So um, I've got Luazi. I'm going to allow the mic. You're on, Luazi and Tembu. You guys have to unmute yourselves as well. So she just allows the permission for your mic, but you have to unmute them as well. Otherwise, we can't hear your question. All right. Thanks, there we yeah. go. Great, great, greetings, uh, Dumsani. Uh, brilliant talk, by the way. Uh, the lecture was very eloquent and articulate. And uh, before I ask my yes, question, sir, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, hey, I, I commend the point that you made about uh, people, many people like, you know, uh, like uh, getting in cybersecurity, but not fully. And I say getting in, getting in terms of like studying and getting those certifications. Then afterwards, they don't land a job, you know. Because I found myself yeah. in that situation where I was, uh, I got a, like five certifications with a Cisco Network Academy. And by the way, most of those certifications are for free. So it's only like the C CNA where you have to pay and you only pay like $250. Late last year, they also introduced another certification because the CCNA is not uh, uh, entry level. It's more like associate, like almost intermediate. Mm. You see, so mm. they introduced, and also it's not for life. It's like what you said that you have to like renew it because the, the, the information and when it comes to cybersecurity and IT, it's always changing due to new technologies. So the question yeah. I wanted to ask was, uh, uh, why is it that when I was doing my applications, right, in Cisco, because I wanted to work for Cisco, when you look at under South Africa, you don't find any entry level positions, right, for, for, for whether it's IT or, 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 or uh, cybersecurity. All of the entry level, junior level positions are in first world countries. So to me, it didn't make sense. Like, because IT and, cy and cybersecurity mm. is still new in South Africa. So now, why do we have that gap where in first world countries where it's been established for over a decade, you know, where 
entry-level mm. jobs uh, opportunities are still there. But in South Africa, where the market is in dire need, as we were told in this uh, mm. essay and Netherlands lecture, why do we have that issue? Um, Lozzy, that's a that's a that's a job seekers question, and I'm going to answer it generically. Um, the first answer is volunteer, right? So it it, it you the formal application route may take a while. And remember what you're doing and what you're up against. You are applying for a position where there is currently an individual with the hope that that individual will vacate and you will come in, or you are hoping that the IT budget will be grown by so much. And in the process, it will uh, 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 cater for new roles and new positions. And we know that IT budgets are being cut and there's a lot of strain in that regard. So, Razi, I would say get in. Whatever you need to do to get through the door, get through the door. There's internal academies that a lot of these companies are hosting. There's a lot of uh, uh, hackathons and, 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 and sort of temporary windows that open now and again. There's competitions. Get involved. If you, I got involved with the radio station after I hacked that database. Thank goodness back then um, <laughs> they I didn't get arrested, but that's how I I loved radio so much, and that's how I ended up on Cape Talk because I sort of cyber stalked and and and, and broke uh, sort of the, the the central database. But volunteer, nothing beats volunteering. Get your get your name into the recruitment database internally, not through an agent, not through a broker house, not through an intermediate. Get your name into the organization but, but volunteer nothing beats volunteering if you if you haven't volunteered or haven't taken a job an unrelated job just so that you can build uh, a cv that proves that you you on a time management you've got you tenacious and you've got what it takes um um then you're not a you're not a safe gamble we need to see that you've been involved at student level that you are on the house committee that you volunteered at junior levels or that you that you that you've been trying okay thank you and um i'm i'm going to offer nati chabalala i put your hand down by mistake i'm sorry um i've allowed your mic you get the last question for the day but we're going to make it a quick one nati chabalala Still there? Okay. Um, then we're on time, Dimasani. So it falls to me to thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, as as always, really, I think these 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 definitely conversations that we need to keep having. Yeah. And it, it's really about this this mechanism from learning to earning. Um, and there's a missing mechanism yeah. in between. And, yeah, I think the industry is, is looking at that. There's conversations coming this year around it. But I agree with you. Go in, roll up your sleeves, do what you can, get your name out there, and and show that you've got spirit and and, and work skills. That's a very good start. So, Dimasani, thank mm. you so much for joining us today. We're going to um, now do the, the quiz. You're welcome to stay on if you wish. But we know you're a busy sure. guy, and thank you for <laughs> giving back and paying it forward. We really appreciate yeah. it. Let's give them a thank round of applause, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thank you, Dumisani, for that great lecture. I learned a lot as well, um, as, as I'm sure everybody else did. And um, without further ado, I'm going to take you through the Mentimeter quiz for the past two lectures that we've had today. Um, Arthur's, there was the one before this, and then we'll go over Dumisani's now. So I am going to share my screen. It's again, optional, not mandatory. If you want to stay on for the quiz, you can. If you want to leave, that's also fine. But these are quite fun. So if you want to stay, this is the uh, code and you join at menti.com. Can you guys all see my screen? The code 76461119. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to get logged on.
there's a few of you. But then, okay. Aha, uh -huh. no. Okay, yeah, like that. Um, okay, a few more. Again, join at menti.com using the code 76461119. I hope everyone's Wi Fi is good enough to join these. I've been seeing some comments from people that it's not working for them, which is a shame, but um, if it works, feel free to log on. Well, can you see how many people are left in the chat just so I can see how many to expect on the Menti? We've got 195, but this is also a spectator sport, Stephanie. True. So I think some like to watch. <laughs> okay, that's also fine. Okay, we're about we're about 30 people and we've seen that more trickle in as, uh, as the game goes on. So I'm going to start. All right, so the first lecture we had today was by Arthur on information manipulation and subversion of democracy. So let's see if everyone was paying attention. First question is, how does information manipulation affect democracy? Is it A, enhances voter education, B, no impact, C, undermines trust in democratic processes, or D, improves transparency? Cast your votes. Got a strong preference for C. and not too much preference elsewhere. All right, let's reveal the answer. Correct, C, undermines trust in democratic processes. Question two, what role do social media platforms play in information manipulation? A, there are they are immune to manipulation. B, act as primary channels for spreading misinformation. C, reduce the spread of false information. Or D, only spread accurate information. I wish. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, everybody's thinking B. With more of you on now, that's nice. Okay, let's reveal it. Correct. B, act as primary channels for spreading misinformation. Three, what is a consequence of information manipulation in politics? A, increased voter turnout. B, improved political debates. C, polarization and division, or D, better informed citizens. What is thinking C? All right, that looks like it's just about everyone. Correct, polarization and division, unfortunately. Question number four, how can democracies combat information manipulation? A, by censoring all online content, B, promoting media literacy and critical thinking, C, ignoring misinformation, and D, allowing unrestricted freedom of expression. And I remember him touching on all of these points, so let's see. Okay, that is just what everyone, I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds. Three, two, one. Promoting media literacy and critical thinking. Indeed, if we censored all content, then we would become a bit like an autocracy. That wouldn't be great. Question number five. What is the impact of fake news on democratic elections? A, no impact. B, enhances the fairness of elections. C, can influence public opinion and voting behavior. Or D, increases voter knowledge. Everyone seems pretty unanimous on this question. Yeah, the guys and are on fire today. Sorry, so they're on fire today. They are on fire today. We had some very, very good lectures. I mean, we've been having great ones, but today I found these particularly interesting. All right, let's reveal it. Correct. Can influence public opinion and voting behavior. Question number six: How do technological advancements affect information manipulation? They eliminate the problem. They make it easier to identify false information. They increase the complexity and scale of manipulation, or they only affect traditional media. OK, we've got a little bit of competition going on here. OK, a bit more of a division. 
Let's see what the answer is. Cast your votes. Three, two, one. It is C, increase the complexity and scale of manipulation. Number seven, what is the challenge in addressing information manipulation online? A, low internet usage. That's a challenge in South Africa right now. <laughs> B, balancing free speech with regulation. C, lack of technology. Or D, public disinterest. All right. A few more seconds. And make sure you're thinking for yourself and not just following the majority. All right. Let's show the answer. B, balancing free speech with regulation. Indeed. Last question for this lecture is, what role does fact-checking play in combating information manipulation? A, no role. B, increases the spread of misinformation. C, helps in verifying and debunking false claims. Or D, only necessary for print media. All right. Let's reveal the answer. Three, two, one. Correct. Helps in verifying and debunking false claims. Very good job, guys. OK, we are going on to Dumi Sani's lecture, Careers and Specialization Pathways in Cybersecurity. This one should be extra fresh, so I don't want to see anyone getting questions wrong. <laughs> Number one, what is a key skill required for a career in cybersecurity? A, proficiency in multiple languages. B, strong programming and technical knowledge. C, high physical fitness. Or D, background in law enforcement. What do we think? Cast your votes. And I'm going to reveal the answer now. Correct. Strong programming and technical knowledge. Number two. What is an emerging area of specialization in cybersecurity? A, graphic design, B, cloud security, C, hospitality management, or D, event planning? I don't know if Dumisani touched on this, but it should be fairly straightforward. Okay, everyone seems to agree on B, and the answer is B, cloud security. Number three, what is an advantage of specializing in cybersecurity? A, lower competition, B, high demand and job security, C, no need for continuous learning, or D, fixed working hours. You've always got to be learning, especially in the cyber field, so it's not going to be C. All right, but the answer is B, high demand and job security. Number four, what is a common entry level position in cybersecurity? This was also touched on in the lecture. A, CEO, B, cybersecurity analyst, C, legal advisor, or D, public relations manager. Everyone seems to have listened. That is great. Correct answer is indeed B, cybersecurity analyst. Number five. How important is certification for a career in cybersecurity? We had lots of questions about this just now. A, not important. B, only important for senior positions. C, essential for all positions. Or D, only necessary for specific specializations. Pass your votes. All right, I'm going to reveal the answer. C, essential for all positions. Six, what role does continuous learning play in cybersecurity careers? No role, only necessary at the start of career, crucial due to the evolving nature of threats, or discouraged to maintain focus? We talked about this a lot, so get it right. Seems that all of you are agreeing, so yes. C, crucial due to the evolving nature of threats. Number seven, how does networking impact a career in cybersecurity? Is it A, no impact, B, important for finding job opportunities and staying informed, C, only useful for senior professionals, or D, detrimental to career progression? Oh, my lights have gone out. There we go. Okay, cast them, cast them. What do we think? And the answer is correct, B. Important for finding job opportunities and staying informed. 
Final question of today. What is a trend affecting careers in cybersecurity? Is it A, declining job market, B, increasing automation, reducing job roles, C, growing importance of soft skills alongside technical expertise, or D, shift towards non-technical roles? Last question of the day, cast your votes and find out how you did. All right, I'm going to reveal the answer and C, growing importance of soft skills alongside technical expertise. So thank you everyone for participating in yet another Mentimeter. We will see you at the next lectures, which are happening tomorrow, I believe. Two of them tomorrow. We have Samantha Rule and Bruce Watson, so don't miss out on those. And I guess we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for all your hard work. Guys, you were great today. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. It's a short week for us. So let's pile it in there and, and make the most of it. We're more than halfway through the course. Let's double down. Great to see you all come in, in, out in numbers. Thank you. And don't forget, you can catch up on the YouTube channel. Um, if you are looking, I'm just quickly posting that link in the at the top of the Q&A for you, just in case you are not sure where it is. And um, yes, we'll see you tomorrow again. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Till tomorrow. Ciao.